Welcome to Conversations with Art Informal. Today, we are with Joey Ayala, the son of our artist. Who are, we are featuring Jose V. Ayala Jr. and his go, ongoing exhibition, When the Eye Wanders Inward, at Art Informal Makati. Thank you for joining us, Joey. Thank you for having me. We would like to begin with it, a, a background of the very intriguing life and mysterious life of your father. Could you let, uh, tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, he was a mystery even to me. He, he's a very, very quiet person. He was always absorbed in something. He would be, when he, when, once he started something, he would just dive into it and di mo talaga may istorbo. Andun lang talaga siya. So ever since my earliest memories of him are like that. Oh, he's constructing a fort out of matchboxes and popsicle sticks. And it's like we were playing, but my role as a kid was to watch him play. Yeah. And it was always something to do with crafts or constructions. And when he started visual arts, he's his first materials, kasi anim kami magkakapatid, no? we were, there were six of us. He started playing first with our leftover watercolors and crayons from school. And then later on, he started buying, uh, if I remember correctly, house paint, latex. Um, and then later on, I, I started to see the Grumbacher label in it, on his desk. My mom says he was a musician. He, he supposedly played violin really well and had a great voice. I never heard him sing. He, he, I believe he stopped being a musician when I was born. And I suspect it's because in his generation, to be a musician was a curse. I mean, what? Walang trabaho, and you'd be hanging out in the bars with, with masasamang tao. Yan yung salita ng mga matatanda nun, mas masasamang tao. Kabaret, sa kabaret, kasama ng mga dancer, kasama ng mga laseng, ganun yung. Hindi lang siguro musician, no? artists in general, uh, 50s and 60s, dahil uh, mababa ang economic value, uh, considered uh, not too much uh, an honorable thing to be or a useful thing to be. In fact, he, he never really encouraged me explicitly to be a musician. He sort of gave up now when he finally decided to buy me a decent guitar. There was there was no encouragement. He just oh sige na nga, parang surrender. Ganyan ka talaga ito na yung guitar. Parang ganun. But uh, both my parents were artists, no? Incl my mom included. Both writers, both painters, both uh, extremely fond of books and music. And so it was normal for me to read, normal for me to write, normal for me to engage in music. And when people ask me, uh, What's, wh what is it like to grow up in a family of artists? I can't tell because for me, yun yung normal. Eh. There's nothing to compare it to. And I don't remember my dad um, hanging out with people. Pag uwi niya, galing sa office, derecho yan, pinta. O kaya basa, o kaya martial arts exercises. His, his time was really super concentrated sa mga interest niya. I read that he had a lot of Eastern philosophical practices. Were you familiar with them? I remember one Christmas, Christmas season, nandun na kami sa Davao del Norte, nakatira, with the house by the sea, inside the banana plantation. And it surprised me because there was a Muslim community uh, pretty nearby. And there were, must have been eight or ten Muslim elders uh, surrounding him. They were seated in a semicircle facing him. And he was talking, he was talking. First time I'd seen him do that. And I asked him later on, why did they come to see you? And he said, they found out I am a Sufi. 
And that's the first time I heard the word Sufi. What is Sufi? So I looked at his books. Sufism. It's uh, it's like an ecstatic part of uh, the Islam. It's it's the part. It's the Islamic uh, color that that engages in ecstasy, in dance, in whirling dervishes. You know, with the, with the very hypnotic music, and then they're they're whirling around in a trance. So, but I don't think he subscribed to any particular religion. He would force us to go to mass, but he never went himself. And I asked, when I was a lot older, I asked him, how come you keep telling us to go to mass, but you never actually go yourself? <laughs> he said, I've, I, I've gone to masses enough for two lifetimes. So, are you now? Transitional yung generation ng magulang ko, transitional yan eh. From the beatniks, papuntang hippie. Hanggang sila sa gitna. So from the Jack Kerouac, from the, the Salvador Dali, from the surrealists, papunta doon sa Woodstock generation. Sila yung bandang gitna. When we were living by the sea, I would see him sitting on a, a stump of a tree. Facing the ocean, and he'd be he'd be you know moving around like that. Then I look up, the three big birds, you know, sumasabay sa kanya. They'd be hovering over him. And this was not just once; it was every day. I'd see it happening every day. These birds riding his energy. He also taught me how to heal, uh, non-touch, parang pranic healing, energy healing, and I did it for a while. I. I but it scared me. Eventually, it scared me because being a, I was not well prepared. I was I believed I was doing the healing. Now, apparently, when it when you do that, your ego takes over. Yung sakit kumakapit sa ego mo. So it scared me because I started seeing uh, energetic manifestations of diseases, and they would me jump out of the people and get onto my shoulders and ah. ah. So I stopped doing it. My dad did it, but only for the family, just for us. I, I never saw him laying his hands on strangers. But he was very, very, very powerful. Many of these seem to appear in his paintings. Now, regarding the paintings themselves, did you ever see them in his lifetime? I, I know that they were kept hidden and he, he was very private. Oh, yeah. It was like a diary to him, you know. He'd come, paint a little. Pag maingay kami mga bata, tumahibig nga kayo yan. <laughs> so we, we didn't have, at least I didn't have a, an instinct to preserve his works because it was always something just for him. And there was a time I, when I was already married and thinking about economics, I asked him, "Why don't you sell? Why don't you sell more of your paintings?" He said, "No, no, it's just for me. Bahala na kayo pag namatay na ako. Bahala na kayo." And I remember he sold a few, but only to friends, and it was always with the, the stipulation that if you ever get tired of my painting, you return it to me and I'll exchange it with another. Na parang sa kanya, sige. Ito, sa iyo, pero pag nagsawa ka na, balik mo sa akin, palitan ko na iba. He was so attached to his paintings. Very attached. Um, he didn't study uh, fine arts. No? I don't know if he could actually draw a face or a hand or yung usual technical demands of a, uh, of a visual artist. I'm not sure because I never saw him. I saw a few attempts at figures, recognizable figures like a human body, etc. during his early painting days. But hindi niya pinursu, hindi niya tinuloy. Kaya naman, nakikita mo, kurba, katawa ng babae, pero hindi niya pinursu. And I think one reason is he had this thing about not doing what has already been done. And he actually verbalized that to me because he used to receive a uh, I think it was Art News Magazine, one of these glossy, thick, glossy, imported magazines. And he had a stack of them in his room. And I, and I asked him, what, what are you looking for in these magazines? 
And he'd say, I'm trying to see what other people are doing, so I don't repeat what they're doing. It sort of stuck with me, even in music. You know, I, I have my idols, I have my influences. But it's for me, it's that was a guiding principle. Don't do what others are doing. It's already been done, so what's the point? Because of that, his works are very original. And, and I know he was painting every day for 30 years. Yeah. So his body of work must be very large. Mm-hmm. We were not able to talk to Norman, and we don't know how he was able to make the selection for the exhibition that's ongoing now. I'm just imagining it must be difficult to select from what is possibly maybe a thousand works. I'm not sure. There are, there are, how do you say it? There are themes or clear clusters, uh, periods, if you will. Yeah, some some did not survive too well uh, from the Mindanao uh, microorganisms. Uh, there are some microorganisms just love felt paper or you know. Nah, may meron lang magaganda yung kinainan tapos ang ganda ng pattern tapos nagbiblend siya doon sa parang collab collaboration between microorganisms and the painter. It's very interesting. You should show those too. Th- those are really interesting. Mm-hmm. Saka na, saka na pag, uh, ano, marami ng zero yung presyo. <laughs> <laughs> so he wasn't, it wasn't just always acrylic on canvas. Was he experimenting with many different materials? I don't know too much about the visual arts world, but I think, I think he experimented a lot more than most. Because I, I've seen, he has a very few pieces na, ano, driftwood. Coated wow. with resin and ang ganda. Kala mo ceramic, sabi niya, wow! <laughs> Meron siya mga pieces na, they're a little too dark to show, so we haven't shown them yet. But he actually, na-influence siya na nanay ko. My mom started using, alam mo yung palwa? It's palwa? Yung palm tree, yung uh, a sheath, a dry mm-hmm. sheath. Na parang it cups the the branches. Anyway, it's it's dark brown. It's fibrous and hairy. My mom started drawing on these things. Nakita nang tatay ko, ah, gawa din siya. And he was he was in a stage where he was he was like going Neanderthal. He was being a caveman. You no, know, yeah, he he would assemble. Is huge four by eight tree bark. It look mukha siyang puno na binalatan pero actually he just pieced it together from trees. And then he would stick uh, by the beach. You find all sorts of interesting things. You find meteors, meteorites. Yung maliliit na tinatawag na agimat. Yung ginagawa ng agimat. Ang dami sa amin nun. They litter the beach. So, and then beads, you would stick beads on it. Ganda tignan. Uh, para ka nakapasok ng kweba. Yung that famous cave in France with the with the paintings of buffalo. Mm. Something like that. Gives you that sort of primal um, experience. But I think his eyesight was failing by that time, so medyo sloppy na yung dikitan. I think he was getting somebody else to do it for him. And you know, when you start delegating, sometimes there's no, walang ingat eh, kasi hindi kanya eh, no? wala yung espiritu nung, so, so walang, nandun sa Mindanao. They're so heavy, I don't want to bring them here. Ang bigat eh. Oh, I, I hope some, sometimes people see that someday. It sounds really, really good. Um, hindi is tayo maunahan there... ng anay at saka. <laughs> <laughs> Yan ang kalaban talaga eh, yung... Uh, the natural decay of material. I, I asked my mom that, why are you using that material? It's going to crack in a few years. And she said, well, deterioration is part of the charm. Mm-hmm. Art that is limited in life by its, by the very nature of its material. That adds the charm. And uh, when I started work, I, I volunteered with the NCCA, National Commission for Culture and the Arts, a few years back. 
I was in the music committee, but I would listen to the, the visual artists discuss. And I realized that one of the biggest expenses in museums is the air conditioning. The air conditioning, like in the Lopez Museums, I don't know, 10 million a, a month or something like that. So in the Philippines, I was thinking in terms of what is indigenous art? If it needs to be refrigerated, it doesn't belong in the tropics. That's mm -hmm. why I suppose that's why uh, acrylic is favored over oil because oil will start to drip in the summer. <laughs> it will ooze down the canvas, you know, and it's not meant for the tropics. So fine art, the concept of fine art as an import is kind of weird. You know, you have to put it in an air-conditioned room. And uh, I was told by my friend, he's Sensei Ruiz, also a painter. My father chose his materials very well, suited to the tropics. Matibay. What? Matibay yung binili ng tatay mo na material. Would you know how his work came to be in the collection of the National Museum? I don't remember. That was in 80s or 90s when that when they were taken in. I, I wasn't part of that process and I was I was busy being me. You know, being a performer, you know, enjoying the ego trip and all that. <laughs> and what about Art Fair Philippines 2019? There was a special exhibition of his work. Do you know oh, how yeah. that came up? Let me see. A year or two before that, we started cleaning the paintings, finally. Uh, I say finally because I always hesitated to do it because I knew I'd have to spend for it myself. But <laughs> said, yeah, let's do it. So we started cleaning. And by the time the art fair came, we already had a, a presentable body. Natanggal na yung mga alikabok, yung mga anay sa frame, natanggal na, all that. So, nagkataon na nagkaroon ng oportunidad. I think an artist backed out or something from the art fair. We have an empty slot. Say, go. So, ano talaga? Uh, I could imagine my dad, you know, wherever painters go after they die. I, can ima I could imagine him, you know. I did that. I pulled the strings. <laughs> And then I started dreaming about him. It was a very nice dreams. He was on a river, on a raft, and he was painting on the raft. And for me, it was really good because I knew he did not like running water. He did not like the ocean. He did not like crossing. I think he almost drowned when he was a young, a young man. And he had a little bit of a trauma in the But in the tubig, he was in the Well, I don't know if you believe in dreams. I do. <laughs> yeah, he probably painted some of his dreams also. Oh, yeah. And if you look at a lot of his paintings, a lot of them resemble underwater marine life. And it's very possible that he was doing astral projection and conquering his fears by going underwater. Yeah. But I, I, I assume, because he had a few books on astral projection, And I studied it myself when I was in high school, but I freaked out. I have very scary experiences because it wasn't teacher. I was just following the book and doing the exercises, and they work. If you do that, they work. Uh, it can be quite scary. But I imagine he might have had access to uh, teachers to help him along the path. Now, before he became a painter, he was also a writer of fiction and poems and plays. And essays. Did you get to read his works? I always tried, but when that time, when I was trying, I think I was too far away from his tone of voice to appreciate what he was saying. It's only now I'm getting to actually read the works of my parents and with the eyes of an adult. So ngayon palang, pero nung nagsusulat sila, na papablish sila. After a paragraph or two, I, you know, I zonk out. I can't understand what they're saying. And then I started to write myself. So I, I, I didn't understand what they were writing, but I understood what I wanted to say. So yung influence ng pagiging manunulat, nandun pa rin. Hindi lang ako makarelate dun sa kanilang sinulat noon. 
Uh, I hope sometime there will be an attempt to put together a book of, of his works or at least some kind of record because he has a contribution to Philippine art history that I think is important even for coming generations to be aware of. He brought something unique. Well, when, when I was early high school, I would hear him talking about a place he would hang out in, Ermita, uh, Indios Bravos. Indios Bravos. And apparently, ambayan siya nila, Nick Joaquin, nila Virgin Moreno, nila Ocampo, Alquas. And he would show his works to them. Both his word works and his eye works, the visuals and the literary. And he would get encouragement for both. And I think that's where he decided to pursue painting from the reactions of the people who were hanging out with him at Indios Bravos. It, uh, the younger people would know the place as Hobbit House. I think it got turned into a folk house later on. Okay. I know it as Hobbit House. Oh, yeah. So before that, it was Indios Bravos, mm -hmm. uh, named after the, the propaganda movement uh, during the revolution against Spain. So tambayan siya ng mga what we now refer to as the big names in art. Pero doon, siyempre, beer, um, barkada, barkada ng magulang ko yung anak ni Dades, ni Vic. We call him Uncle Vic. Uh, and his daughter was my Auntie Joan. Barkaya ng close friend ng nanay ko. And she was married, I believe, to Jolly Cuadra, another of the 60s, 70s uh, cele local celebrities. He was famous for, I don't know, getting drunk and looking good. I don't know what people are famous for. I'm curious if you yourself paint also. I tried. I tried. Uh, the leftover paints on Tateco, there was in Cuba, we had a, we had a water tank. And we put walls around the tower and turned it into a little pad house. I called it a pad house. And the majority of the natitira puti. So, of course, all the gulay is pastel. Because the pula is put in the puti. The blue is put in the puti. We end up everything. Looks like, when you come in, psychedelic Walt Disney. Okay, is there one more... Really, uh, is there one more anecdote you want us to yeah, know? I'd, I'd wake up almost every morning uh, with the sound of uh, him doing his iron palm exercises. You know, he'd be he'd be in a horse stance, dropping his palm on a, a bag full of iron filings. So the sound would be boom, boom every morning. Uh, that's what would wake me up. He was adept. And but he was also a healer, and he was because he was doing the internal side of martial arts. There are two sides: the internal and the external. The external side, maninigas yan, magkakarong ka na mga kalyo, very obvious yung mga muscle. Yung internal na martial arts, very soft. You don't see any signs, and that's what he was adept at. Extremely powerful, but no signs. Malambot ang kamay, ang ganda ng fingers niya, malakang mahikita ng like with weights or anything, walang ganun. Pero extremely powerful. He had this huge piece of wood. He toss it up in the air and catch it on his forearms, roll it. Oh, Shaolin. Parang Shaolin monk, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you saw the pictures. He's a big guy, right? But sometimes he'd go for a run and he'd run for two hours, three hours. It was freaky, huh? How does he do that? <laughs> Pero yun nga, uh, internal... Chi, yung, yung kanyang inner energy, yun yung malakas. And when, when he passed away, uh, kwento ng mga kapatid kong babae, because they were present when he died. I was, I was at home sleeping. When he, when he died, they say, something whooshed out of his body. And yung sa hospital, yung kisame sa hospital, hindi ba, uh, are squares of uh, board na nakapatong sa frame, kumalabog, gumano'n. 
so a gust of wind exited his body and ma- made the ceiling boards clatter. And he was also obviously making art for the sake of it. And he he was so that's why his intentions were so pure and it comes across in the works. Yeah. And you have to you have to remember uh, when we moved to Bindanao in the 70s. He was not in touch with an art community for many, many, many years. And he just kept on painting. So a lot of the works that, that he produced were just not in the flow of any mainstream. Because he had no mainstream. He was alone. He was a hermit. He was solitary. And he was looking at magazines in order not to repeat. So it was a very purposeful uniqueness. A very intentional uniqueness. Uh, well, interesting stories because we tinitirahan namin noon sa Tabindagat ayon sa isang manggagamot na dinala namin noon para bumisita lang you know padami pa mga psychic sa Mindanao eh brought him to visit sabi nung matanda ay ano ito palengke ng mga hindi katulad natin pero in Bisaya ano? mga diliin ato mga laman lupa baga Kasi kikwento yung tatay ko na sometimes he'd be painting tapos yung sinasawsawa niya ng brass mawawala and then he'd find it under the bed. Pinaglala, sabi niya may ano rito, may kinagkakatuan ako ng kapre. but alam mong kapre? Kasi yung beads ko, yung kanyang meditation beads na araw-araw niya ginagamit, pag nawala, nasa puno. <laughs> Kaya sabi niya kapre kasi matangkad din, eh, nasa puno eh. At yung kapatid, kapatid ko at saka asawa ko, nakakita talaga ng mga duwende as in Walt Disney. Bukang Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Ganun daw talaga. <laughs> But they were sitting on a branch outside, watching them inside, and looking into the house. At parang may spotlight the branch. Really strange occurrences. So all these mystical occurrences was happening to him for these all these decades. Oh yeah. Uh, yung, I hope... When I grew up in the 60s in dito sa Cubao, yung lote namin uh, I don't know if it's true pero dati daw concentration camp ng hapon. Marami ring mga pangyayari doon I remember in my childhood. Uh, looking back, I rationalize I see it was just my vivid imagination. But while I was experiencing, totoo talaga, you know, to a kid what you experience is real, right? So if you see a half a body with bat wings carrying a papaya and you know flying across your garden, it's real. If you see something crawling out from under your bed into your aparador na naka Japanese soldier uniform, it's real. So looking back now, I must have been hallucinating, but it was real. And uh, half of my adult mind still says, totoo yun, totoo yun. Nakita mo talaga yun. And my dad was part of that. You know, he in the 60s, he would uh, tie strings to the windows and doors at night. Tapos yung dulo ng tali may lata. Kasi na, uso yata ang nakawan noon. So, yun yung aming burglar alarm system. Uh, so, ritual yan. And he'd walk around the house with a long stick. Tapos may, yung may goma ng uh, pirador sa dulo. And he started killing lizards. Eh, ako sa akin, ang tingin ko sa lizard, pet. Eh. Nag-aalaga ako ng butikino na hintayin ko bang itlog, I hatch the egg. Pero siya peste kasi bakit tinataihan ang painting? Tapos yung tae, pag dumikit, lalo pag fresh paint, sisira na yun. Pag, tinang, pag tinanggal mo, kutkutin mo, sira na yung painting. So, so he was ruthless in that sense. Anything to protect the paintings, bahala na pumatay ako ng butike. <laughs> ako naman, wag, wag. 